Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to everyone. I hope you are safe and in good health. Now, thank you for joining uh, the enrichment session for the paper strategic business leader. I believe we are all in the right place and at the right time by joining this webinar. Now, my name is Joanne, the manager of learning support for ACCA Malaysia. I'm here introducing our speaker, Sean Cassell, an ACCA and an expert tutor for ACCA. Now he has more than 25 years of teaching experience. Now Sean will go through the session structure with you in a short while and share a little more of his experience and involvement in KL, which you will find surprise later on. Now before I hand over the session to Sean, um, let me quickly run the housekeeping item with you. Now, we will be using the chat box to communicate with everyone. If you have any questions to clarify while Sean is presenting, um, please type them in the chat box and then select send to everyone. Now, Sean will address your questions whenever possible. Otherwise, you can actually save up your questions, you know, and ask towards the end. Okay, so let's not delay the session any further. Um, over to you, Sean. Hey, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're well. Um, well done for joining this session. Really important uh, three weeks before the exam that we get everything we need to pass. And, you know, we really need to thank Joanne for organizing all of this and Ryan in the background, uh, making sure that all the technology is working. Um, I, you know, hope you are going to ask me lots of questions because really the whole point of me being here is for you. I'm here for you to help you be the best you possibly can be in your exam. And um, I, I want to, you know, I want to do that, but it, let's, let's ask any questions you want. I'm going to, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my uh, chat box uh, as the main method via which you can speak to me. Um, so if you want to ask me any questions at all, please put them in the chat box. Um, I've already got a question actually. So just to encourage people to ask questions, I'm going to answer Chong Yong Hong. He says, you're taking the physical exam at the examination center. May I know, is it paper-based or computer-based? Sorry for asking this because I'm the first time taking this paper. I think it is more, well, 99% going to be um, computer based. Would it be, Joanne, is there anywhere in Malaysia which is still doing paper based uh, exams? No, it is computer based exam right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought so. I thought so. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I was. I was just going to uh, just uh, I'm just clicking on here, Ryan, it, uh, with just a, a slight admin before we get fully. If I press record, it says stop recording and I don't want to stop your recording, Ryan. So I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. If you just let me know in the chat box, just so we've got a double um, a double safety net. So people, if, if they uh, need to review any of this, they can do. Um, yeah, uh, so just just let me know in the chat box um okay all right all right i'm going to share my screen and i want you to let me know in the chat box that you can actually see my screen just bear with me one second um so when i share the screen and just let's get this set up so it starts perfectly from the beginning um, share. okay um, so you should have there a screen with um, my face on it with a red banner above can we all see that just let's get used to using the chat box in the bottom of your panel if you've not used uh, zoom before uh, so we've got lots of, of great yeses coming through. Thank you very much. Raji, Wendy, Alice, uh, Leong. No one else can see it apart from those people. Let's get used to using this chat box. Anis, Y, 
Min, uh, Yong, Kit Yan, Serena, Chien Chien, Nicholas, Nicole, fantastic. Shah, great, great, JL, great, 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 great. Uh, fantastic. So, um, where where are we all calling in from? Um, where, where whereabouts are we all calling in from Malaysia? Tell me where in Malaysia you're calling in from. KL, Ipo, KL, Johor, Selangor, KL, 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 Shah Alam, Johor, Kuching. PJ, Johor, Ku, yeah, it's interesting you think of PJ, not KL, but fair enough. Subang, yep. Uh, okay, Ipo. No one from Penang. Klang, by the sea. Sabah, okay. Um, oh, I'm not sure where Nagari Sembilan is. You'll have to educate me there, Annalise. Um, don't think I've been there. Um, Okay, okay. So, uh, well, I'm calling in from London, and um, I'm, I'm here to help. Please use the chat box to ask me any questions you want. Uh, in terms of what I'm going to do here, sorry, I'm just going to just stop sharing my screen a moment. I've just got a little clangor in there. Um, Bear with me one moment. Right. I just got it. Bear with me one second. Right. Presenting view. Okay, okay. So you, you've got now a thing on your screen. If you can just confirm for me that doesn't have my photograph on. Correct. Just let me know. ACCA Malaysia workshop, one final push. Fantastic, fantastic, great, great, great. Um, so, as I said to you before, let me just see, this is. Uh, okay, okay, yeah, a little clangor, but um, welcome, 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 welcome. Um, to give you, as Joanne just said, a brief summary of my background. Um, I've been working with the ACCA for, for quite a long time. Um, in terms of what um, qualifies me maybe to teach to you, talking to students for 25 years, um, I've, uh, in the UK, there's a, an award where you know, people vote for the Lecturer of the Year. I'm the 2020 Lecturer of the Year. I've been runner up for that award on a couple of occasions. And most importantly, over the last 20 odd years, I've worked with the ACCA as the expert on the case study exams, which uh, involves me training tutors to teach uh, students well, and also involves me helping students um, in countries where pass rates are low. So um, yeah, that's, that's kind of me very briefly. But the reason I want to just tell you a little bit about me is that there are lots of people online who claim to be SBL experts. And I just would warn you to be very wary of them. And I think there's a lot of fake news out there. Anyone can set up a YouTube channel. Yep, there's no policing of it. Um, anyone can say anything on the internet and there's nobody going to question what you're saying. So. Elvis is still alive. I read that on the internet. The moon is made of cheese. Uh, do you believe those things? I don't think you do. So why do you believe someone who starts shouting and pointing and 
telling you how great they are and how much they know about SPL. I think the little check I would do is find out their name. Hopefully they give their name and then go onto the ACCA website and put their name into the ACCA website. Mm -hmm. I don't think the ACCA website will recognize it yet. So if you did the same with my name or a colleague of mine, Tom Clendon, who's in SBR, you will see lots of references to me by the ACCA because um, the ACCA trust me to talk about SBR. If the people talking are not trusted by the ACCA, I wouldn't waste your time. Often these websites are free. Often there's adverts either side of them. Just be really careful because we've got three weeks to maximize our success. And I don't want you wasting your time on things that, that are wasting your time. Yep. So be careful, be careful on that. What else do I want to say? Well, uh, again, I'm talking to you um, via Zoom link, but uh, you know, I've been coming to Malaysia ooh, for a long time, for a long, long time. I've been coming to Malaysia when the only shopping center in Malaysia was lot 10. Yeah, when there wasn't any LRT or monorail or anything like that, this was how you got around on the Bass Mini. Some of you probably weren't even born, um, but the Bass Minis were crazy buses that used to race each other around the streets. Uh, there was no Petronas Towers when I first came to Malaysia. Yeah, and uh, it's a shame I can't see you in person. Go and have all that great food uh, that you have, roti chennai for breakfast, uh, a bit of uh, kind of street food on Jalana Law. I've never done anything with the AC. Well, a long time ago I did something in Penang, but I know if you're in Penang, I love all the food in Penang as well. So, um, yeah, I have a lot. Of, I also set one of the first accountancy colleges up on Jalan Pudu in KL um, back in the in the late 90s. Emil Wolf and uh, was involved in FTMS setting that up. So, yeah, I've got lots of experience of KL. I know how it is. Um, I was with you probably about three years ago. I think, Joanne, we were last there. So, um, yeah, lovely always to help people from Malaysia. You've got a great country, um, but you've also got exams in three weeks time. So the first question in the chat box I have for you is how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Yeah, we, you feeling about SPL? Well, how are you feeling in, in general if you want? Just let me know in the chat box. What are your worries? If you let me know your worries now, I can maybe tailor something so that, um, I can help you. Sean's a bit nervous, anxious, too much topics, anxious, nervous, nervous, a little bit anxious. It's always good to be a little bit anxious. Stress. Oh, if there's stress, stress is, um, you've got to be careful with stress. So my advice to those of us who are feeling a little bit stressed is, Check out mindfulness and breathing techniques. Some deep breathing, put your brain in another place because um, yeah, that's, uh, that, that's important that you, you look after your mental health. Look on the ACCA website. They've got some really good uh, techniques on how you can deal with your stress. So check that out. Just go on to ACCA, uh, put mental health into the search box. And there's a number of exercises uh, which a doctor will go through with you just to calm you down. And it's important to calm yourself down. Um, in terms of answering questions, um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to help you today um, put together something on how to answer a question. Um, so um, Nadira wants to know how to make sure you don't black out or freak out whilst answering the questions. Well, again, it's about breathing and it's a bit bringing yourself down, calm. Yep. Um, Chong Yong is not familiar with the formatting of the answers. Uh, well, okay, we'll talk about that. Don't worry about that. We will, we, that's the whole point of this scheme. Um, I'm also uh, today going to give you a link to enable you to do a mock. And I'll talk about it later, but it's so important, so important that you do a mock exam. And I know from working in your area that people say, oh, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. 
okay, you only need to be ready on the day of the exam, but to get ready, you've got to make some mistakes first. And that's why you should do at least one mark, maybe two mocks, get some feedback. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's really important that, and people say, oh, I'm not ready. You need to get 50 or more on the day of the exam. Okay. To get 50 or more on the day of the exam, you have to make a few mistakes before the exam. And I'm going to show you the mock and show you how you could approach the questions. And that might make uh, you have a bit more confidence to tackle them and then tackle them on the uh, ACCA CPE platform and see how you get on. Because you, you, know, you don't want your time to be taken up trying to get familiar with the CPE platform for SPL. It is slightly different and it's, it's really important that you practice. Yep. So we're going to talk about more of that later. Uh, Sean's saying, what about getting into the mindset to approach the questions and scenarios? The questions I should ask myself while I'm reading through. Good question, Sean. Um, sometimes when I come up against a brick wall on a question and it's like, oh my goodness, what is this question about? I, and I can't see it. I step back and say, well, this question's in the area of governance. Okay. What do I know about governance? I know we should have NEDs. We should split CEO and chairman. We should have AGMs. Uh, we should have more NEDs than executives. Okay. So would any of those points work in the context of this? I suppose we could talk about NEDs and then we can start rolling. So that would be what I would suggest, but I'm going to talk about lots of these things. Yep. So um, in terms of how we're going to structure our time together and what we're going to look at, um, First of all, I'm going to um, make sure you fully appreciate the rationale um, on the SPL exam. Um, and I'm going to talk about what the examining team have said all week. And to be honest, I'll share with you a couple of uh, kind of meetings and um, webinars I've run in the past. And you'll see that the examining uh, team find the same weaknesses every time. So students obviously never read the reports. I'll talk about how SPL is marked. I'll talk about why people fail it. Um, I'll talk about technical knowledge, but remember, it's not a technical exam. I'll talk about how we must, uh, how, how we deal with the CBE platform and we must do a mock exam. And then I'll talk about how we get ourselves into the right mindset. If there's anything else you want, just message me in the chat box and I will try to deal with it. Okay. So the first thing, the first thing we need to be clear on um, is what is SBL and why was it set up? Yep. Well, let me just remind you. SBL was introduced in, I started working on SBL with the ACCA in about 2016 um, and the exam was launched in about 2018. And the whole point of SBL being launched was to enable students to uh, have a mindset and an approach to life which is reflective uh, of the future of the world of finance. With another hat on, I do a lot of CPD on the future of finance. So lots of qualified co companies, I was working with a company this week, on, on storytelling, uh, on influencing and uh, better communication. So, you know, a lot of this stuff that traditionally accountants did is now done by bots, uh, AI bots and stuff. So it gives the accountant time to give more insight into the numbers. So SBL is, is uh, a response by the ACCA to say to companies, look, we're listening at the ACCA we know that the demand of future accountants is less on regurgitation of facts because computers can do that. And this is why we brought SBL out. So in terms of uh, what the examining team say SBL is, they say, you know, it's a substantially integrated exam. Yep. Uh, and that means rather than get candidates to simply demonstrate knowledge of a subject area, you need to blend that knowledge um, with commercial and practical focus. Yep. You're going to have to, um, 
address issues as a strategic leader. So you need to think about how would a strategic leader behave? So what, what does that mean? Well, some of us might be learning all the theory, which is fine, but we wouldn't be using that. We wouldn't be regurgitating the theory in our exam answers. Yeah. So to take an example, you might have a really good knowledge of pastel, um, but in the exam, you wouldn't want to be, uh, you know, regurgitating all of pastel. But what you would do, you'd, you'd know what pastel is. You'd read the scenario and you would use pastel as a framework to analyze the organization's environment, should we say, and then what you would do, um, you would actually be able to identify what the most relevant bits of Pestel uh, in the organization, in the scenarios environment were. You wouldn't be someone that just lists out political, economic, social, that wouldn't be very professional. That wouldn't be what you would do at work. Yeah. So you need to kind of use a bit of common sense. You need to use a bit of evaluation and you also don't need to just use Pestel. You can use as many models as you want, which are relevant. So you can use a mix uh, or you don't have to use any at all. So yeah, it's making you behave as you would in the workplace. Yep. That's key to SPL. It, it's a practical exam. Yeah. Much more workplace related. So if you're really stuck and you're not thinking, oh goodness, what can I say here? Well, what would you say at work? A lot of people put a different hat on in the exam than they would have in the workplace. And often you'd be able to answer the question in the workplace, but in the exam, you're kind of thinking, which model is it? Yeah. But if you get this right, um, you know, the exam is going to help prepare you to be a leader in the future, help you manage a team. Yeah. Because it's practical. It involves role play and it's about how you behave in the workplace. So, yeah, it, it is a great exam that, you know, we, we need to get better at. Yeah, that's what it's about. Now, I'm just wondering, I've got a link on the screen. You can have a look at this link. Does this link play? Let me just see. No, uh, I'm going to just pull that back. Um, yeah. So if you have a look at this link on YouTube, this is a... Um, it just might affect some people's bandwidth, so I won't play it. Um, but it, it's talking about how the world of finance is changing and pretty much saying what I've just said. Uh, the future is one where accountants are able now to give much more insight into the figures rather than just report the figures. Uh, you need to uh, tell me more what the figures mean. And this is the same in the SBL exam. So uh, you won't on SPL get any marks sometimes for just doing a calculation. But what you need to do is, so if you just did calculations and no explanation, there wouldn't be any marks. You need to help the marker know that you understand the consequence of the calculations. Yeah, so that's what this video says. I would encourage you to, to have a look at it. Um, what else? Um, in terms um, of why we've introduced it, well, pretty much um, what I've just said, really. Um, in that video, it talks about the drivers of change being, you know, technology primarily and business wanting, um, you, you know, more insight from finance and it's great if you can calculate tax and you can do balance the accounts, but I need you to tell me what that means. I need you to explain. I need you to tell me the so what, the consequence. And we'll talk about exam answers in a moment. And if you are able to explain the so what and the consequence, then you'll be really good at SPL. Um, the accountant of the future needs new competencies, communication skills, needs to be more skeptical, needs to have more commercial acumen, all of this is tested in the professional skills marks. Yep. So those capabilities and competencies are tested in a practical way. Yep. So yeah, have a look at all of that. Um, you know, the governance changes we also get tested on. Um, so the ACCA is trying to make ACCA 
the most relevant accounting qualification going forward. Uh, in the chat box, uh, thank you. Uh, there is a YouTube video where you can watch the future of China finance, but maybe not now. So how are we studying for SBL? Well, I advise you to obviously be guided by the syllabus, but you don't need to get sucked down into the real detail of the syllabus. Yep. And what I'd say to you is have a good understanding of the things that are covered. So what does a good leader look like? Yep. What would the traits of a good leader be? Uh, governance, you need to know what good governance looks like. So governance is really about the problem, that the agency problem, where shareholders own the company and they employ managers to manage the company on their behalf and to make sure that both interests are balanced. So, you know, there's a lot of governance in place. So there could be the managers might pay themselves lots of money and rip off the shareholders. So governance uh, has uh, the suggestion of using committees like uh, in terms of pay, remuneration and benefits so that, you know, someone independently uh, decides how much the managers get paid, not the managers. Uh, you should appreciate strategy. I think an easy way for you to appreciate strategy. If you go on to the ACCA website and you go on to SBL and you look at articles, um, or put my name in the ACCA website, there's the strategic planning process part one, and there's a strategic planning process part two on the website. Now, this is a three or four page article with a question. Um, and it just shows you how to break things down. When looking at a question, is it talking about choice? Uh, is it talking about analysis? Or is it talking about implementation? And once you are able to identify whether it's analysis, choice or implementation, there are frameworks that you can use to help develop your answers. So we've already talked about analysis. Is it asking us to look at stakeholders? So we might use stakeholder mapping. We might do a brainstorm of who the stakeholders could be. Is it asking us to look at the environment, PESTEL? But equally, we could use Porter's Five Forces. Uh, we could, if it was an international, also look at Porter's Diamond. But the answer in the exam wouldn't want you to regurgitate everything. The answer in the exam would want you to maybe brainstorm that in your plan and then pick out the most relevant points to help develop your answer. So have a look at that. Risk, we need to assess risk. Uh, again, when we do a risk assessment, we look at the likelihood and we look at the impact. And you might be familiar with the Tara model. So you appreciate that. Technology is ever changing, but we should appreciate how technology can help us. So it's not just big data, three Vs. Uh, it's more than that. It's about how, you know, when we go shopping and we, uh, you know, scan our card, which creates, um, you know, customer relationship management data. Uh, they know when you shopped, what you bought, what you paid with, all to build up a picture of you, the shopper. So it's not, it's, you know, it's not a technical exam, as I'll say in a moment. Um, you should appreciate where control could be better. So we're looking at it, where could control be better? Uh, we should also appreciate how finance can help, but that's not meaning regurgitate lots of theory. What it's meaning is we, well, to, to give, give an example, uh, there was a, a, an exam not so very long ago where the scenario gave a company and the company was say, for argument's sake, in the hotel industry and the gearing, average gearing in the hotel industry was say 70%. And then the gearing, if you calculated it in the scenario, had moved from say 25% to say 50%. And everyone said, oh, it's terrible. It's awful. The gearing in the company's doubled. It's, but in context, the gearing was still only 50% when the gearing or the average gearing in the industry was 70. So it wasn't such a big deal. And people were not able to understand the figures in the context of the scenario. So finance, you always need to be able to understand the relevance of it. Um, and yeah, that's the key thing. Uh, and then the final thing on innovation and performance excellence and change, change comes up 
relatively regularly. So when we're looking at change, you should be thinking about um, why do people resist change? You should be thinking about how we change. So we think about unfreeze, change and refreeze. And when we think of change, we think participate, educate, communicate, don't really use power. Um, and then when we are refreezing, we think about how to embed the change into uh, people's mindset. So, you know, maybe with rewards, with new procedures, that kind of thing. So that's the, um, the, the key areas. The red boxes, the red boxes represent uh, the professional skills marks. So again, go onto the ACCA website, look at the professional skills marks, how they get awarded, look at some past examination paper answers and see how marks differ between zero and maximum on professional skills marks. With regards to official answers, remember they have a tutorial purpose. You are not expected to write an exam to the extent which we have in those tutorial um, answers. So what I'm going to do, I've been talking a little bit there. Does anyone have any questions on what I've talked about so far with regards to why it's been introduced and you know, any specific aspects of the syllabus. I'll give you a moment to give you the opportunity. Um, James, is the Ukraine situation relevant to SBL on this sitting? <laughs> um, well, the exam will never be political, um, James, but I think you know, there's, there's a few lessons from um, the Ukraine situation. Um, I think one of them would be uh, in business, it would be unwise and it would be risky. Uh, we have a saying in the UK to put all our eggs in one basket. And basically, if you look at places like Italy and Germany, I think they get about 90% of their gas and they're very reliant on gas for their heating and power, they get it from Russia. And, you know, the world is finding what Russia is doing abhorrent and want to kind of not have any association with Russia. But that's quite difficult to do if 90% of your gas comes from Russia. Um, so I suppose the impact on supply chains, definitely. Um, the political impact it's had, you know, globally on the price of oil, uh, how oil has gone up just because the supply and demand of uh, you, you know oil food is going to go up inflation so you know appreciate uh, Ukraine's one of the bread baskets of the world with producing lots of grain for flour for bread for other stuff and uh, if they're all at war the farmers aren't working and that's going to again upset the equilibrium of how food uh, is uh, sold so yeah, in, in, in terms of a general, yes. Um, Junwei says, in the exam, how much mark should we expect for each point, especially for the slide answer? Well, I'm gonna say more about that, Jun, in a moment, but on the slide answer, most of the marks are going to be awarded in the notes. So you're not really gonna get any marks for the slide, but what you, so say point 0.1, point 0.2, point 0.3, point 0.4 is in your slide, and then, you in the slide notes do a subheading point one and then explain and then a subheading point two and then explain that's how you get marks on slides not for the actual slide most of the marks are all given for the notes so just just be aware of that um, so i'll talk more about how we get marks in a moment and then break that down um, if you don't remember the specific term in the exam uh, yes, so ways I say, if you don't remember the specific term, would it be able, would it be okay to use a layman's term? What you've got to remember, Way, is that it's a practical exam. It's how we would behave in the workplace. So um, would you use those terms in the workplace? I think you would. And you probably might not use a specific term because not everyone would understand it. Yeah, so think about how you behave in the workplace. Really important to make sure your mindset 
is tuned into that. Okay. All right. Just checking my power is on. Don't want it breaking uh, in the middle. <laughs> um, okay. There is a really nice infographic that you can access again on the ACCA website. And, and in that infographic, um, you've got a kind of a flow through of how the various elements of the syllabus are created. I think, you know, from the stuff I do in, in other, you know, I do work on um, kind of how, how people can be more effective in their study. And apparently we, we remember 10% of what we uh, read, we remember 70% of what we see. And if you create your own visual yourself, you'll remember even more. So I think in studying, it's quite good to develop mind maps and pictures because we were, our brain is visually wired. So you need to set it up to remember mind maps and pictures. Yeah. So have a look at that. Make sure you understand it. Um, I've got something else. Uh, James says, what's the pass rate for SBL in Malaysia? I, I, I think Joanne would be the person to answer that. But on, on pass rates, um, I think you have to, again, put them in context. Yep. If you are um, studying on your own with a manual at home and are not getting any help and don't do a mock exam, don't get any feedback on what you're doing your chances are going to be a lot lower yeah so on my course i'll i, I run some online courses and and I, you know my pass rate's 90 odd percent and i've said oh wow that's great well it I, I would be embarrassed if it was less than that really because uh, and if you do all the three mocks and all the rest of it it'll be a hundred percent pretty well 98 percent 99 percent um because you know, that, that person has had much more help. So to take a general, uh, you know, average, it, it, I never think it's that useful. Um, you, you know, I think that the, the global average is like, I mean, how can the global average be 40 and, um, you, you know, mine is 98 or something like that? Well, because, it, you know, mine have, you know, they do three marks, they get the marks, all the rest of it it's a very different experience and the very different preparation so i'm not sure joanne's saying it's it's 48 to, yeah it's about 50 ish percent yeah but I, I think don't let that put you off if you prepare properly yeah some people don't prepare properly sadly um and, and you do mocks like i'm going to advise you and you can you don't need to pay to do these what you can do what something on the acca website that put and you follow the stuff on the acca website you're going to do well in the exam have confidence in that. Yeah. So don't be, don't think, oh, only 50% of people pass. 50% of people who are prepared, structured in their study, do not pass. Many more than 50% who are structured and well prepared pass the exam. So just be careful using statistics, I would say. Um, oh, lots of questions coming through. Fantastic. Uh, I've just said, um, so why mon says can we answer the slide in the word processor um no would be the answer to that if i asked you to provide some slides at work and you said oh, i haven't done any slides but here's a word processing um, summation are you going to present a word processing summation as a presenter in the workplace no you're not so there is a slide functionality which you must become familiar with Yep. And if you look on the CBE platform, you'll see that there is a slide area and then there's a slide note area and you must use that and you must become familiar with it. Um, thank you, Joanne, for the pass rate. Uh, can we cite Malaysia case study as an example? Uh, well, well, you can, James, but if you if, if you just said, e.g. should uh what, what's that the debt crisis is that what the the server dynamic is that what it is um i mean i go to malaysia and, and i'm very familiar with malaysia i've probably been to malaysia more than 50 times uh i've, got, I've gone at least twice a year for the last 
15, 20 years at least, probably sometimes, you know, eight times a year. And I don't know what server dynamic is. I, I had did do some work once in an office next to the guy that had the big yacht who caused a problem. Is that what server dynamic is? You'd have to educate me. But the point is, if you just say, EG, server dynamic, if you said server dynamic, which in Malaysia was a situation whereby X, Y, Z, and you were using that to help explain, fine, of course. Um, but, but you need to explain your example. Yeah. Um, the people who mark SPL are chosen to mark SPL because of their expertise in the subject. Sash Dev says he finds that in past year papers, the professional skills marks requirements tend to vary and some even expect things that I would not have thought of. Not really. The professional skills marks, you know, I've been involved in every single exam, Sash Dev. Uh, you're there for commercial acumen, for evaluation, analysis, skepticism and communication. They're not equally balanced on each exam, but that is all the professional skills marks will ask you. And the other thing I would say on professional skills marks, which is important, is to read, it'll say, you know, professional skills marks are awarded for skepticism in doing mm, 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 mm. and it's the mm, 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 that you've got to focus on. Yep. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, have a look at, the, at, at an article on the ACCA website about professional skills marks, um, but they're only on five things. And uh, if there's any variation on what they're required, that is clearly explained. Yeah. So, um, yeah, oh, there's it. Thank you again, um, Ryan and Joanne, for bringing me that infographic. Um, also, are subheadings in your answer really necessary? A good question, Sash Dev. What I might do for the rest of this presentation is I'm just going to talk about HCCA, HBL, and I'm not going to take any breath, and I'm going to talk the whole thing like this, and then we're going to talk about the exam, and after we talk about the exam, we're going to talk about that. How, how would you like a presentation like that, Sash Dev? Yeah. Is that, would, that, would you prefer that? Or would you prefer me to take pauses? Would you prefer me to use high voice and then low voice? Because that is the written equivalent. So is it necessary to use subheadings? Well, if you want people, if you want the marker to love you, Sash Dev, and you want to help the marker navigate your answer and see what you're saying and therefore maximize your marks, I would suggest white space and subheadings is a good thing. It's not a legal requirement, um, but I would suggest it is a very useful way of helping the marker navigate your answer. And in the workplace, would you use subheadings in a report or would you just do a monoblock? Have you ever seen a set of accounts? Are they just a monoblock or are they spaced out with subheadings and white space? I think you know the answer. Uh, thank you for the server dynamic but I, I'm not aware of that. And maybe it's something recent. Um, John, is it, is it okay if we don't cite real life issues at all? Uh, of course, of course. And it's not really asking you to, but it's good to picture what's happening in real life, I think, John. That's what I'd say. Um, James says, is there any sample mock exam answer that you have marked that is publicly available? Well, there's the one I'm going to encourage you to do where the ACCA will release a video on it. And I think if you go onto the ACCA YouTube channel, you'll also be able to find um, a, an approach to a previous exam as well. So again, how I wonder how you're studying, James, but if it's on some free website, it's not my recommendation. Yeah, the best free website in the world for the ACCA exams is the ACCA website. They put a lot of effort into it, loads of great resources, they all have the blessing of the examining team and the education team. So that is where you want to be. You don't want to be on all these other idiots on YouTube. There is an ACCA YouTube channel where you can uh, go and look at students. So look at that would be my advice. I can see some of the questions touch on things like AFM and APM. Of course they do. How familiar should you be with them? Well, you know, you could say gearing is, I mean, you need to have commercial awareness is that. So, uh, you would, you know, how do we raise debt? 
you know, what affects how we raise debt. That could come under AFM, it could come under APM. But it's not, I'll talk about it in a moment, it's not a technical exam, but um, yet yeah, it is, you, you know, you're supposed to have a broad perspective. Wyman says, do we need to quote the exhibit number and the answer? Um, it depends on the context of the question why. Um, potentially, you know, from exhibit two, we can see might be something you might want to say. Yeah, so great, lots of great questions. Hopefully, um, my answers, if, if, if you don't agree with my answers, please come back at me. Um, I won't think you're rude. I think you're, you know, I'm, I'm not answering correctly. So please come out and come back at me. Um, so great, great. Okay, thank you for those questions. Let's, let's keep that dialogue going. That's, that's fantastic. So as I say, have a look at the uh, ACCA uh, mind map there. Appreciate that the SBL exam is not a technical exam. So someone said, what are the, you know, are there any new technical articles? What, what's the key things I need to learn? I mean, you need to understand rather than learn because it's an applied exam. As an applied exam, you can't really learn it yet. You need to apply and express opinion. You need to have confidence to express that opinion. Yeah. Um, James says, uh, again, James, James well, I'll, I'll, do, do I think integrated reporting will be the bulk of the question in most sittings so that you can push for more companies? Um, no, I don't. Um, it won't be the bulk of the question, but on the point of integrated reporting, James, if, if you are someone that is aware of what's happening in the workplace, if you look at the top 200 companies in the UK stock exchange, yep, and you read their annual reports, you will see that pretty much all of their reports are not a set of accounts, but it's an integrated report. So, you know, maybe only half, sometimes only 40% of the report will talk about the finances. Others will talk about impact on the environment. It will talk about impact on their local community. It will talk about staff. It will talk about all things like that. Yeah, uh, sustainability. So that's what's happening in real life, James. You know, that's, that's how real companies behave. So I think the examiner would expect you to have an awareness of what typical companies do. And probably if you answered the question, integrated reporting, integrated reporting is the six capitals. When we look at the six capitals, the six capitals are the, 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 but not actually applying anything to the scenario, that wouldn't get you Sorry, I just pulled my microphone out. I didn't pull it out, I hope. Still hear me? Just say yes. Great, thank you, Nadira. Um, so with regards to integrated reporting, um, it won't be the bulk of a question, but it's something that most companies would practice these days because uh, you should know why would we do. So don't just know the six capitals. Be able to question why would you do integrated reporting? And you would do integrated reporting because shareholders just don't want to have a, a, a rear view mirror um, a kind of summation of what the company did last year. But they want to be able to assess whether investing in this company is a safe bet. And they will do that by looking at, you know, how, how are you in What is your strategy? Uh, what is your approach to staff, to culture, to the environment? Um, you know, and, and you would report that. Um, and th that would help maybe investors have a more long term view of your business. So can you see how it's practical rather than learn integrated reporting or learn the six capitals? Um, again, is, it, is there any technical article we need to read? Well, I'll just go back here. It's not a technical exam. OK, so how can there be technical articles for a technical exam? It's um, it's an applied exam, yeah, and you need to have confidence. Um, I think you should, uh, a good student would be keeping up to speed with what's happening in the real world. So, you know, you would and, and, and be commercially curious about the real world, like the example I just gave about Russia and about supply chains and about the upset in the dynamic of supply and of demand and how that affects inflation. So how does inflation affect things? So uh, a 
a liter of diesel fuel, um, well, to give you an example, a liter of diesel fuel a year ago might have been um, about five ringgit in the UK. Yeah. A liter of diesel fuel today could be as much as 10 ringgit. Yeah, it's gone from five ringgit to 10 ringgit in a liter. And not only that, the government have decided that diesel fuel is polluting. So there's a lot of discrimination against diesel cars, uh, you know, congestion charges and all of that. So there's a political dynamic. There's also a, an economic dynamic. And there might be you considered not very green to be driving a diesel car. So, you know, appreciate, you know, a broader perspective, which is helped by Pestel. Yeah, so great questions. Thank you. Uh, uh, is the paragraph for the answer will influence the marks? Um, well, there's an Raji said so for, for 12 marks, you must write six paragraphs. So Raji, you're assuming you're getting two marks a point. I'm going to tell more about that later. And no, you're not going to get two marks a point. Yeah, if you write six paragraphs of a sentence, let's say you're going to get maybe six marks. So be careful thinking you just get two marks for a paragraph. How is SPL different with SBR? Well, uh, SBR is a, an accounting exam that asks you to look at um, financial accounting and stuff. SBL is a strategic exam. Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm not sure what that question means, James. It's not quite clear. Uh, how is SPL different with SBR? Uh, that's clearly explained on the end. I think you mean something else. Reword your question and I'll try and answer it. Um, I mean, you know, how would throw that back at you and say, how is SBR different to F7? And it is a little bit different. Yeah, you know, there is a little bit more um, opinion required on SBR, but it is still much more uh, rigid than SBL is. Okay. I am going to keep going then. I'll come back. Uh, we've got more questions coming through. Um, let's talk quickly about the exam then. Yeah, and the former and structure. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but just, you know, might, I might be, uh, there might be a couple of things I revealed to you that you hadn't thought of. It's four hours. You must practice on the CBE platform if you haven't done so already. There are 100 marks, but there are only 80 technical marks. Yeah, uh, that makes a difference. You get 20 professional skills marks. And to get those professional skills marks, you don't have to write anything. You just have to demonstrate professionalism in your answers. Um, and people think they, oh, I'm just going to go for the technical marks, not the professional skills marks. I would say that those marks, if you answer the question through the lens of the professional skills marks, they, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. They're, they're actually integrated. Yeah, and they complement each other. So you must be really, really clear on planning your answer, what the professional skills marks are asking you to do. Yeah, important. What else can I tell you about the exam? Well, you're, you only need 50 to pass. So people ask you know, how many prize winners? It's like great to all that. But honestly, anything over 50 is wasted energy. And we need to not be disheartened if we're not getting 50 in our mocks we need to get 50 in our mock on the day of the exam and the only way you're going to get 50 or more on the day of the exam is make mistakes before the exam because if you don't make mistakes before the exam those mistakes will be made in the exam yeah so really important to do mocks you've got quite a lot to read i can talk a little bit about how to read it they're all based on the same scenario and you're asked to, you know, think like you'd behave in the web, in, in the workplace. Okay, so that's, that's your exam. Um, what do I want to talk about next? Well, I want to give you some feedback, which you can access a lot of this feedback um, on the ACCA website. And if you look at examiner's reports, there is a, you know, people say, oh, why don't, they publish every single exam. Well, if you want to know what was in every single exam, you can look at the examiner reports because an examiner report is written for each exam sitting. 
Yeah. So they taught, you know, this question was about governance and students didn't do very well because they did this. This one was about, you know, innovation and et cetera. So what does the examiner say? There is a, a report uh, published here. This is a September, December, a full comprehensive examiner report uh, that I just want to go through. But to be honest, uh, if I went back to 2018, 2019, uh, 2022, it would say the same thing. Yeah. Have we read examiner reports? Yes or no? Have you read them for other subjects? Let me know in the chat box. Okay, good, good, good. Um, for SPL or for SBR or for FM or something like that? SPL, okay, okay, well done, Hannah. Um, not so many answers to that one. Um, these are free resource the ACCA produces. Unfortunately, to understand them, you have to access and read them. They're there for you. They're published for good reason. Whoa, I think we have to give a big round of applause to uh, the people, Joanne and Ryan, behind the scenes here. Bang, straight away, they're straight into um, their link. So thank you very much. That's fantastic. Um, just on that one, um, Joanne or Ryan, um, what will students be able what what do these what they should be doing with these links should they copy and paste them into their own um you know just for future reference it comes up here but we've now posted a few up will they be able to access this chat box or should they be copying and pasting these links for future reference okay click uh, click and download it uh yeah co copy it yeah maybe copy it for now that will be advice so just remember We've given uh, links on an examiner report. If I go through the chat, we then gave a, a link on the infographic. Um, and we also uh, talked about a YouTube, what's happening in the future of finance. So thank you very much, uh, Ryan and Joanne, for that. Fantastic. Um, so great. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's have a look at why people fail the exam. And the reason it sounds a bit negative looking at um failure but um i think you know we 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 want to make sure this doesn't happen to us so why do people fail well firstly um their technical awareness is poor those with good technical awareness sadly don't answer the question that's asked and this can sometimes happen because of being stressed yeah uh, some people, you know, just make irrelevant points. It's got to be in the context. And some people just regurgitate everything. What you are being awarded marks for an SPL is the ability to take information out of the scenario, have your technical information and blend it together. That's the skill. That's the skill. Um, so, yeah, make, make sure that is you. Um, if we were to... Uh, look at other things that we need to be aware of. Um, points aren't developed. So I think what you need to try to do, uh, you make a point and, and I, I think, yeah, that, that was a good point, but you just kind of give me a bit of a bullet. And you wouldn't have made that point if you didn't know the relevance of that point. But as a marker, I wouldn't be employed to interpret what I think you mean. I would give you marks for what you actually say. So if you don't, if you don't say it, I, I, I struggle to give you marks. Yeah. So just be careful on that one. Um, we also uh, need to be embracing our professional skills marks. So when we look at um, commercial acumen, you know, that means, I mean, what do, let me put it back to you. What, what do you understand by commercial acumen? Anyone want to have a try? Okay. Thinking as a businessman, Quang. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. 
So I, I in London, I drive around in a um, a Proton Saga, a 1990 Proton Saga. Yeah, it's probably worth about a thousand pounds. And um, I'm thinking about putting some, I, mean, I just want to smarten it up a little bit. So I'm thinking about putting some uh, $10,000 alloy wheels on my 1990 Proton Saga, the same wheels that you get on a Bentley. Do you think that would be a good idea? To put some Bentley alloy wheels? Why not, Chong? <laughs> I think you know the answer. It would be crazy. Yeah, it would be crazy. <laughs> so that's what commercial acumen is. You know, it would be what would be an appropriate financial or commercial investment in the context of what we're doing. So, yeah. Um, John... Uh, first time studying uh, for SPL, that's fine. Most of my students only study once. Uh, do I need to cover the entire syllabus? Well, ideally, John, yes. We have an exam in three weeks. Um, you know, we no normally have an organized, structured approach of study. I would, yeah, at different people, it depends how much time you've got. Um, so, you're saying, is all the technical articles important and necessary to be covered? You should be aware of it, yes. Uh, during the, after reading the entire question, including the exam, I'll, I'll go into detail about how to read an exam in a moment. Yeah. So, yeah, I'll come back to you on that one, how to read it. But, um, yeah, commercial acumen. Um, what else don't they do? Well, they respond to the requirements in maybe a um a professional commercially sound manner they just give an answer whereas the, there's you know commercial acumen in the requirements um and also people i'll talk about it later the rule of and so it asks you to do x and y and because people are stressed they just do x and the marking scheme say there's 20 marks there might be up to 12 for x up to 12 for y maximum of 20 they can't get any more than than 12. Make sense? Yeah. Um, what else? Um, technical knowledge is not great, but it's not a technical exam, but the technical theories will will help. And this technical knowledge will help catalyze your answers. Yeah. So it, it gives you a structure, it gives you a framework to build around. So that's important. Um, and what I do is I use that knowledge to help plan. Now, the next point about not answering that. So these are all just to contextualize. These are things the examiner has said that is wrong with students answers. And I, I see this a lot. Um, not answering the question asked. Yep. Um, people will um, do better if you copy the question, title it plan into the word processing area. I personally wouldn't do it in the, in the um, scratch pad area. And I wouldn't do it in the scratch pad area because um, scratch pad doesn't get handed in. So it can't be marked. If you're a borderline student, it would get over 45. Um, and you know the examining team want you to pass. So to help you they will potentially look at your plan as a general rule of thumb they won't look at your plan but they might look at it if you're getting over 45 and so it must be uh, titled plan copy the requirements in and then from the requirements you can start developing a plan yeah so what i would suggest that you do is you read the requirements once the requirements not the whole case you read the requirements twice. You then do a brainstorm and a mark focus. So how many marks? So, you know, it's Pestel. How many do I need? I can get a little two on political, two on economic, nothing on social, a couple on technological and so on. And then create a plan. And then before I jump in, I read it a third time. And now you can start. Now, a lot of people don't do that. They see the question. This is what it's about. Vroom, and they go and answer it. 
sadly, they see a different question to the question that's asked. And sadly, they don't get any marks. So some people say, I haven't got time for that. I haven't got time to do all that. It's a busy exam. Mm. You know, there's a saying, fail to plan, plan to fail. The plan is for you. It doesn't have to be beautiful. Yeah. But I sometimes in my brainstorm, I might take my brainstormed points and then use them as subheadings, copy and paste as subheadings to my answer. So it's quite useful to do that. Um, so yeah, think about that. What else? Um, people, as I said to you earlier, the examiner agrees with me, don't develop points yet. If you just copy case information, you're not gonna get any marks. I want you to ask yourself why. I want you to ask yourself, so what? Yeah, so why? So what? You made a point. Why have you made that point? Yeah, what's, what's the reason you made that point? People don't often do that. So really important to do that. Um, in terms of what the examiner would say with regards to marks per point, this is what the examiner says. Up to two marks for a well-developed point. Yeah, it's only going to occur, though, if you've identified and explained a point and then developed this point about saying, you know, how significant is it? Information in the case to develop the consequence of what you've just said. Yeah. Are you supporting it with examples? You're only going to get two marks if you do all of those extra things. Otherwise, if you make a well-developed point and it can't be a bullet point, a well-developed point, then you'll get one mark not two, one. Yeah. Uh, James says, do I need to link the point to a specific exhibit case material? Um, not necessarily. I mean, you, you, you know, but, but if appropriate, yes. But, you, you know, you, say the scenario was about, um, I don't know, a shop and you used, um, you know, uh, an, an example from your awareness of shops in KL that, you know, rents are going up that makes the retail experience more expensive. You know, just gave a suggestion and it's not mentioned in the scenario that that would be a typical problem facing retail on the high street. So you, you don't, you could bring that in as well. Quang Fai says, how about some point copy from, no, if you just copy stuff from the exhibits, no marks, because you're not going to get marks for copying. But if you, Copy from the exhibit maybe into a plan and then you reword it and restate it and reinterpret it your way, there's a potential mark. Yeah, but just copying, I mean, the, the examining team really don't like just copying. So be careful on that. Um, what else? Uh, people don't have commercial acumen. Well, to have commercial acumen, you know, make sure you contextualize it, the point you're making, that's important. Uh, don't respond in a professional manner. What that would mean would be, uh, this is trying to prepare finance for the future. So if you were talking to a non-financial person and you were to talk to them in financial jargon, they wouldn't understand what you're saying. So the examiner would be keen to see that you can tailor your message according to who you are talking to and the context. So think about who you're talking to, what tone is appropriate. Yeah, that's what we mean there. Provide everything that's required. Well, um, you know, I would always be looking for the marking scheme. Um, sorry. So what just happened there? Um, always try to identify the marking scheme. Um, Copying and pasting large amounts of stuff, no mark, sadly. Yeah, so that's what weaker candidates would do, according to the examiner. Um, weaker candidates just regurgitated everything about Pestel. Yeah, so, you know, that's not great. So the, the report I've just given you was uh, 2021. Uh, if I was to then go and show you the report in 2020 it says pretty much the same thing poor analysis not addressing the requirements not developing points uh calculations um weren't well done time management and professional skills 
<clears throat> so they're all key things. Do we have any questions on that? But that is comprehensively explained in the examiner's report. Uh, Gloria asks, do the examining team prefer one mark per point or two marks per well-developed point? Well, obviously you should be aiming, if you can, to get two marks per well-developed point. But I think some students just think they get two marks for a point. You know, the thing I just explained there is, you know, really important um, for you to go back over. Yep. Have a digestion of that. Um, because if we just give a point, you know, is it worth two, two points? It can be difficult to often get two points, if I'm honest. Um, uh, let me have a look. Um, is there a fixed format style for report briefing notes email to a CEO or is a student? Uh, well, what I'd say to you, James, is in Malaysia, do all companies uh, get told by the government? So uh, Maybank, MAS, Sime Darby, the government tell them you must do a report like this. Is that how it is in Malaysia? It's not like that in the UK. I mean, acknowledge the request would be my uh, response, James, in terms of is there a fixed format? No, because different companies do it different ways. But there is a general norm to how it should kind of look. And probably if you're not sure how it should look, look at some official answers. But, you know, it's just to acknowledge the request, I think. Um, should we expect points we write as answer be derived only from technical marks, but not from the professional marks. Uh, well, as I said to before, John, the, the professional marks help us craft our technical marks. So it is quite important. <clears throat> Sashdev says, how do you know when to stop? <laughs> what, in life in general, Sashdev, or in the exam? Um, you have a budget. How do you know when to stop spending money? You know, you run out of it. <laughs> Uh, I'll talk about a bit of that in a moment about time management. You've got to be super, super strict. Yeah, would be my advice. So thank you for those questions. They're great. Let me have a look then at how SBL is marked. Um, I'll give a quick overview of uh, how SBL is marked. I'll talk a little bit about why people fail it. And then... Um, and then I think we'll have a break, yeah? Um, so let me talk quickly about how SBL is marked to give you some confidence. So um, in terms of SBL and how it's marked, uh, I'll give you an overview of the way it's done, the principles of marking, and uh, a tiny bit on professionalism, on professional skills. Yeah, so in terms of what it looks like, uh, there are four exams a year now, as I'm sure you're aware. So there is more than one examiner, you know, there's an examining team, but the examiner would be called the marking session lead. And there would be someone kind of holding the examiner who's independently uh, employed by the ACCA to the education qualification, qualifications technical person who, who would just check they're doing everything right. The examiner would then have a team of people, some team leaders and markers. Yeah, depending on which exam, but you know, there could be quite a few. Each team leader might have seven to 10 markers. So how does it work? Well, um, the uh, exam, so you sit your exam in June and then it, obviously it's electronic. So they all get onto a database and the examiner will take a, well, we'll be reviewing the scripts and then we'll take a sample of six or six to 10 scripts that they'll mark Every team leader will also mark those scripts. And although there is a rough marking scheme, they won't really, you know, they'll all mark it as they see marks should be awarded. And then what happens is they, they all come together after having marked those 10 scripts and they say, well, what do you give for question one? And I says, uh, script one, question one. Oh, I gave that seven. Oh, I gave it a nine. Ooh, why did you give it a nine? 
and they spend maybe eight, 10 hours deciding exactly when one mark will be awarded, when two mark will be awarded and so on. And what then happens is from that, they develop a marking guide. Yeah. And then what they then do is create some uh, scripts that they ask the markers to mark with a marking guide. Yeah. And they show them where marks should be awarded and they train them. And then once the markers have gone through all their training, they get given some blank scripts and asked to mark them. If they don't get, you know, within a very, you know, three to 5% tolerance of the examiner's marks, they're not allowed to mark until they get perfectly accurate. And then once they're allowed to start marking, there's something called seeding scripts sprinkled within actual student scripts and a seeding script will again have been marked by the examiner. The examiner knows how many marks they should get for that. And if they don't get, you know, within 2% or whatever of the mark, that again will um, stop them from marking. So my point is very, very thorough. Yep, it's very, very thorough. So that's, you know, markers, uh, there's a seeding script, they're allocated um, and, and they're watched throughout it. The principles of marking would be that the suggested answers that are published are exactly that. They're just suggestions of very high scoring answers. They're very comprehensive. They're there to help with future teaching. Yeah, there are many different ways to get credit on SBL. There's no negative marking. You know, students worry about negative marking. Um, will you get penalized with spelling mistakes? No, you won't. Yeah, but I would just say, you know, help the marker mark your script. Yeah, John said, for certain questions, it requires us to draft a letter report on behalf of someone else. In this case, shouldn't someone, in this case, shouldn't someone and someone without putting, it depends on the context, John, you just have to do it as it is in the context. Um, I would, I would, would be my answer. So suggested answers, Credit can be given for any. There's no negative marking to summarize it. And there's no marks lost for poor spelling and grammar. Yeah, basic principles of marking. Uh, other principles, as I've just said, one or two marks per mark, um, but you've got to develop it. Marking will reflect the intellectual level. So if you just copy and paste, I'm going to talk about the intellectual level at the moment. That will not be appropriate. Technical marks are on the context of the scenario. Yeah, so it's not just regurgitate Pestel, it's about how does Pestel uh, reflect. In terms of intellectual level, there is a standard which examiners need to observe, and it's called Bloom's Taxonomy. We don't need to know too much about it, but in this diagram, at the lower level, you've got comprehend and remembering. That's kind of like the skills level uh, analysis and apply might be applied skills. At the strategic professional level, you're about bringing information together, evaluating it, connecting it, drawing conclusions, synthesizing is what the ACCA use. Yeah, so um, yeah, candidates who just churn out book knowledge on SBL will earn very few marks. Yeah, that's the point. So a Bloom's Taxonomy Intellectual Level 3 is about creating new insights. It's about making judgments, justifying, recommending, uh, evaluating the complex information, putting your own spin on it, not copying and pasting it. Yeah, that's important. Okay, got a question. Uh, is introduction required for each answer? Um, it's nice to have James, but I, I wouldn't be spending too long giving big flowery introductions because um, they're not often going to get any marks. You want to be getting straight down to business of mark acquisition. So I think it would be appropriate and professional, but I would try to keep it brief. It's a good question, but don't go into lots and lots of detail because it, you know, it's a time restricted exam. Okay. So we've talked about, um, how SBL is marked, the weaknesses of students and the rationale behind it. Why do people fail SBL? What's the reason they fail? Well, I'm going to link this to something after the break, but people fail exams 
I would suggest that in addition to what the, uh, you know, you find in the examiner report, they'll fail the exam because of poor time management. Um, they don't read and plan their answer. They just jump straight in. They don't really have good business writing skills because they, they probably don't read any business journals and they don't take any sort of notification of the professional skills marks. So how do we overcome those key reasons that people fail? Well, the first one on time management, um, I think someone asked, how do, we, uh, how do we stop? So how do we use our time effectively? Well, when time is up, you must leave. So the golden rule is you must have a strict budget. To tell you how I would come up with a budget, you've got four hours. Four hours is 240 minutes. If you are, you know, a lot of students can take on the tasks and the exhibits in about 40 minutes. Yeah. So take 40 off 240, you get 200. I divide by 80. Why do I divide by 80? Because the professional skills marks, 20 of them take no time to get. So that gets me two and a half minutes a mark. Okay. My advice to you, treat it like a project management exercise in mark acquisition. Now, if you're a bit shocked and you're thinking, oh my goodness, there's no way I can read and plan in 40 minutes. All right, let's take it a different way. And let's say um, you spend 60 minutes. So what you would do then is you would have 180 divided by 80 and you get two and a quarter minutes a mark. You choose, but you know, practice and you get better would be my advice. The other thing uh, that's really important is to stop you you must write it down. So on my script, I would write down start and finish. Yeah, really important. What about dealing with a scenario? Well, I'd try to break it up. Yep, I would label the exhibit. So what I would probably do, I would read the introduction. Having read the introduction, I read each of the tasks. The tasks are now in my brain. I then look at exhibit one and I might label exhibit one as being relevant to task one and to task three. Yeah, I, I might do some highlighting. Yep. Um, I'm trying to picture what is the story telling. I'm trying to visualize it. I'm trying to make it real. Yeah. So when I was talking, I'm trying to see what's happening. Where are we? You know, it's not all in the exhibit. Yeah. So we think about that. Um, if we're reading and planning, what would I do? I would copy, as I say, into the word processing area. I would maybe um, talk about the key words, the format, the verb, the rule of and. Now, this is where people only answer half of the question. So when we talk about the rule of and, here's an example. So discuss the benefits and drawbacks of World Alliance membership to PC Airlines in determining its future aims and objectives. So what we need to see there is benefits and drawbacks, aims and objectives. Yeah, people often miss that out in the exam and try if you can to spot the marking guide. Yeah. So, for example, if a question says discuss whether or not the objectives of directors of a quoted company are likely to conflict with those of the company's shareholders, 10 marks, what are we going to get here? Well, maybe up to four marks for objectives of directors, up to four marks for objectives of shareholders, and up to four marks for the conflict, maximum of 10. Yeah. So always be thinking, it's about how many marks can I get out of this? It's a mark acquisition project. Students just write an answer. It's about you maximizing your marks. So please think about the marking scheme. The marking scheme drives your time. It drives how much you're going to say. It drives your white space, your subheadings. Really important. Yeah. What else? When you're presenting, make the marker's job easy. Yeah, as I said earlier, someone said, do we need to use subheadings? Well, you don't need to, but if you want to get maximum marks, you should do. So gaps, white space. Yeah, I also think, you know, when you're starting an answer, a good opening statement. It's like meeting someone for the first time. Do they give you a big smile, a firm handshake? Otherwise, you just, 
I think you psychologically make the marker think, hmm, I'm not sure you know what you're talking about. Yeah. In terms of white space, uh, I've done exercises where you ask someone to mark a script like this and you give them the marking scheme and they mark it. And then you give them exactly the same answer and you present it like this and you ask them to mark it. Um, if you just say, look, you know, here's the marking scheme, when, when you're finished, pass it to me. Or if you give them this script and say, bit of time pressure, you're always going to find that this script is probably going to not, the marker is going to miss some points in this script compared to this script where the student has clearly made each point separately. So that's important. Um, what else are we going to do? Well, the examining team would say this. The most important thing for you to understand uh, the exam is to sit a mock exam. Yep. Um, a lot of students uh, say, I hear them say, I'm not ready. When I've run mock exams in Malaysia before, it's interesting. Uh, I'll sometimes, because if you say there's going to be a mock exam tomorrow, no one will come in tomorrow. If I say there's going to be a mock exam over the next few days, they don't know. So they want to do the knowledge. So I might come and say, OK, we're now going to do a mock. I'm just going to get some paper or a clock and I'll just go out the door. And I know that as soon as I go out the door, everyone's going to run out of the room. So I just wait behind the door and say, ah, thought you were, where are you going? Do the mock, please. Oh, I'm not ready. Can I do it at home? I'm not ready. I don't quite understand that. You've got to, you, you've got to make mistakes to get better. Yep. If you're not ready for the mock, you'll never be ready for the exam. The way to get ready for the exam is make mistakes, reflect, and don't do them again. You only need 50. So even in the real exam, you can mess up 50% of it. But if you've done a mock, you will learn things that you won't repeat. Yeah, timing, CPE familiarity, all of these really important. Um, I don't, Jody says point form with full sentences is allowed. I wouldn't use bullet points, Jody, if that's what you're saying. Um, I would give an articulated sentence. Yeah, the analogy I use would be, you know, you go to a fine dining restaurant. Do they carefully lay out different pieces of food on a beautiful white plate, lovely tablecloth, sparkling glasses, or they just <laughs> slop it on there? It's the same food but you're not going to be paying a hundred dollars a plate for something slopped on there, but you would happily pay a hundred dollars a plate for something that looks very beautiful. Yeah. So think of it like that. I will give you more marks for a more beautiful answer. Um, the fail, which you might get in a mock is not an indication of failure. It is a learning experience from which you'll get better next time. Yeah. You reflect, what would I do better next time? Yeah, that's what a mock does. Yeah. So really, really important. I would say maybe if you've got a study buddy, you know, chat with them, reflect on your experience together, think about how you can get better. Yeah. So a mock, the most important thing you can do. Um, to be familiar with this CBE, you hopefully are familiar with that, but if you're not, you need to check out the ACCA website. There's lots of great information on the ACCA website. Yeah, so to just summarize, what does a good answer look like? It's well presented, it makes the marker's job easy with good layout, good opening statement. Um, you know, that's what it looks like. Okay, it would also, um, have a start and a finish. Okay, so that is hopefully some of the solutions to stop you making mistakes many students make in the exam. Um, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to talk about um, how we deal with technical knowledge. 
but I think you've been listening very attentively. You've been um, asking me lots of great questions. And um, I think we have a quick break. I think we, we take a quick uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. Uh, let me have a look. It's um, uh, what time was it in Malaysia? Now it must be four o'clock in Malaysia, is it? Um, so it's four o'clock in Malaysia. Should we come back in 10 minutes time? So if I could, uh, if you can get back at 10 past four, make yourself a quick cup of tea, comfort break, and we will start all again. The questions that are in the chat box, I will come back and uh, answer those questions. But I think people, yeah, we've been going a little while now. Let's, um, let's have a quick break. Hey guys. How are we? Ready for more questioning? Give me a yes if you're there. I've just had my Nasi Lamak traditional English breakfast. It's the afternoon for you, isn't it? Hey, hey thank you for getting back, everybody. That's great. Um, I'm just going to move my Zoom screen up there. Perfect, perfect. Okay, um, I had a, let me just go back to some chats. Um, so Yong said, regarding planning answer stage, read once, read twice, and brainstorm and planning, read three times. Is it read all the tasks? No, no, Yong, it's not. That would take far too long. It's literally reading the task requirements. Yep. So I would do that for each each case. Yep. So it's not the whole thing. Um, but but thank you for confirming. <laughs> Excuse me. Um We've had uh, evaluate the attractiveness of the proposed. Are we still expected to produce a balanced answer? Pros and cons. Exactly. Yes. Uh, Wong says, can we apply the model without mentioning the model name? Yes. Uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't mention the model name in the workplace. So that's completely correct, uh, Wong. There's no marks for mentioning any models in the exam. I think there was the specimen paper one that did ask about a model, but no other exam has ever asked about a model. There is not marks for mentioning a model. James says, how do we contact you in the future? I'll, I'll put some details. I saw that. So I'll, I'll put some details on a slide for you, James. But um, I mean, I, I post quite a lot on LinkedIn. So uh, LinkedIn is a kind of like a business Facebook, isn't it? And I, I put stuff up there. Uh, so you can contact me on LinkedIn. I also uh, send a newsletter out for free to students, just telling them what they should be aware of and what's important. So you can sign up for that. I mean, it, it's it's not just SBL, but it's pretty SBL. It's about exam technique and stuff like that. So I will leave those details up uh, towards the end of the session. So let's continue. I was going to talk about how do we deal with technical knowledge. Um, let me just see because we stopped it. Uh, does that right? So <clears throat> the technical knowledge is there as a catalyst. Yep, a catalyst to help structure our minds, our frameworks. It's not something to reveal in your answer. I think technical knowledge I've described as the secret tools of a strategy consultant. So a strategy consultant, when crafting a strategic report for a business. Uh, will often be hanging their argument and structure on a technical framework, but you you will never reveal it. They'll never reveal their sources. But but me as someone that you know reads a lot of strategy and is aware of stuff, I will know what they're using. Yep. Yeah, so um, don't reveal it. Don't talk about it. Okay. Um, so use use the technical knowledge in your planning. Um, if a task asks you to uh, look at the external environment, you would brainstorm pastel. So you'd put that down and that's what I would use to maybe help me, but I wouldn't use every single one of those. Yep. Um, I would pick out what the most relevant bits are. You notice I haven't just done economic. I've also uh, just to help me think, is there anything under 
inflation, exchange rates, interest rates, GDP stage in the cycle that might affect the dynamic of the situation. But I, I couldn't really think of one for political, but on the social, the demographics is the race religion dynamics or work patterns and leisure patterns or lifestyle patterns different. And that just helps me come up with more answers. Yeah. So that's what I'm, I'm going to use there. Oh, sorry, I missed legal out at the bottom, didn't I? So, um, yeah, important. I got a question from Hannah. Let's say if we did not use any models to answer a question, that would be absolutely OK, Hannah. But the answer scheme provides a model that they use uh, suitability, acceptability, feasibility. Does that mean our answers are completely wrong? No, no, not at all. Um, I would suggest that if you had thought about suitability, acceptability and feasibility as a framework, you probably would have come up with more points because it would have helped you think about more points, but it doesn't mean your answer's wrong, no. Does, hopefully that helps. So, there, you, you know, there's, if you look at the marking scheme given to the markers, uh, credit can be given for any relevant point. I would just suggest that the technical frameworks, if one is appropriate, and it's not always appropriate, is probably going to catalyze you to come up with more things. Okay. Alrighty. Um, so how is SBL different to other exams? Well, it's technical knowledge that's applied. It's in the workplace, professionalism. Yep, that's what we're looking at there. Um, and yeah, what about dealing then with the CBE platform? Yep, well, the best way to deal with the um, CBE platform is to get on it. Yep. So I think there's some amazing resource that the ACC education team have produced. So you need to get on it. But what do students tend to do? They copy and paste loads of amounts of information. You've got to remember um, a marker is going to be looking at 100, 200 scripts. They know everything in the exam. But if you just copy and paste, that is not following what the exam is trying to inspire you to do. Remember that word synthesis. Synthesis is about connecting. Yep. You add value by putting your own spin on things. Yeah. You don't add value by dumping knowledge. You will get no marks if you dump knowledge. Always worth trying to think of as an academic theory to help you plan, but don't reveal it in your answer. Uh, think about how you would behave in the workplace. Would you develop to your boss messy, unstructured uh, reports? Yeah, think how it would be done in the workplace. Yeah, important to think like that. Um, you need to also uh, be thinking about how you use a spreadsheet. If there are any calculations, you do them in the spreadsheet area. Yeah, and then you would say uh, you'd have appendix in your spreadsheet and you would comment on them in the word processing area. That's what you would do at work. You would use a spreadsheet at work. You wouldn't use a calculator. There's too much uh, potential for error using isolated calculator calculations. Yeah, and also at work, would you go to like 12 decimal places and new, use no roundings or separators or would you use them? Of course you would, it would be unprofessional not to. So why? Do many students not do that in the exam? I don't know, but they don't look professional. Yeah. So make sure you do that. Um, and to do that, you need to practice on the CPE platform. Uh, slide functionality, as I said to you before, most of the marks are coming for the notes to the slides. So again, practice on the CPE platform. Um, what else would I say? Word processing tool. People use it for calculations. No. Copying whole exhibits, no. Slides, uh, they use slides when they're not asked for, and then they, um, well, sorry, they don't use slides when they're asked for, and then they, they, use, they, they use slides when there is no requirement for slides. They don't use notes, um, and sometimes they don't do anything. So be careful, be careful. Uh, what else would I say? The spreadsheet tool. Um, they, I see spreadsheets with loads of calculations, but none of them are referenced. Not going to get any marks. Yep. 
Um, they use the calculator rather than the spreadsheet formula. Crazy. Yeah. Calculations are all in one cell. You've got to help the marker follow your logic. And as I just said to you, they don't use roundings and separators. Um, it's not so relevant on SBL. I've never seen a question requiring MPV and IRR. It's about using the numbers rather than working them, but you should be familiar. Certainly you should be familiar with the functionality of MPV. Makes it much quicker. Yeah. Um, what else is wrong? Answers are too short, no development, you know, the significance, the so what, the consequence, uh, and, and supporting examples. They're all things that I want you to include in your answers. Okay, so that's kind of reminding you of some of the things we've said before the break. Um, to just uh, general things, too much copy and paste. Uh, I see comments like, oh, it's quite good. So as a, an accountant and a financial report, profits were quite good. Is that what you would say? I don't think so. Um, you, you need to justify and say, you know, that uh, concerning because margin has fallen by X percent. Yep. The answers are well structured. They have subheadings. They have white space. They're not non-professional. They use uh, spreadsheet functionality correctly. Uh, they don't just use bullet points. They develop those points. Okay. So have we got any questions on any of that? John says, could I just put down the result of the calculation percentages in my answer? Um, well, I think, John, what I'd say, I'd say uh, from Appendix 1, which in the spreadsheet you've titled it Appendix 1, we can see that the percentage is. I think that would be more appropriate. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just in case it's wrong, John. So at least then the marker can look at the spreadsheet and see what percentage you came up with and then realize that you just made a simple calculation and then the own figure rule would apply. So the own figure rule means if you made a mistake, you only lose a mark for it once. Okay, um, right, let's go on then. Um, <clears throat> what we're going to then have a look at is... Uh, how do we, um, or, or, yeah, why we must do a mock exam, yeah? And firstly, talk about, you do a mock exam to get familiar with the CBE. The first question I would ask you is, how did you learn to drive? Did you go on to YouTube? and watch lots of videos of how to learn to drive. Did you read a book? Give me an answer. Nor also, since we put calculations in spreadsheet function, do we need to show the formula? Mm. Well, the form, I don't understand your question, Neural. I mean, spreadsheets are formulas. So the marker would be able to look at your spreadsheet and check the, check the formula you used if it was wrong. Um, but think about how you learn to drive. In a book? I don't think so. Yeah, you actually did a driving, uh, a car, a driving school. Were you ready to drive a car when you first went on the road? Probably not, but that's how you got better. Yeah? How did you learn to swim? Yeah. Did you learn to swim by reading a book as well? No. Yeah. I'll repeat what the examiner said. Yeah. Said sitting a mock exam to time is the most important element in preparing for the exam. Making sure that you're ready. Making sure you understand the dynamics of time. Making sure you understand that it's not that bad. So that worried factor all those fears you were telling me right at the beginning it's actually it's not that bad but sometimes you have to face your fears yep uh you'll understand that um your timing messed up so you need to get better you you'll get lots of experiences doing a mock exam which will make you better yeah if you can get someone to mark and give you feedback even better yeah so um 
if I was to uh, talk about um, SBL marking, just to remind you, I've said suggested answers are examples of strong answers. Credit can be given for any answer um, and there's no negative marking and no marks for lost spelling. So what you have a link to um, is a pre-June mock exam. Now, um, I'm not going to go on to the, uh, the platform here because sometimes when we're broadcasting and then I go on to another live platform, there's sometimes a time delay and it all goes a bit messy. So what I'm going to do, and you might want to you know, come back and review this video and uh, you, you might want to kind of uh, look, look at the, uh, the, the things I'm going to say. So what I've done, I've taken what's on the CBE platform and, and I've created all of this for the ACCA uh, that's on there. And I've copied and pasted the requirements. Just so when we look at the requirements, what would we think? Yep. So on this mock, you have an opportunity to go on to, uh, you've got to go through all the instructions. They're all clear here. I would suggest you have a go at it tomorrow. Yeah, have a go at it tomorrow. Oh, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. I'm going to be giving a, v, a video debrief of this, uh, I think on the 26th. So we're, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll do a video live debrief. The answers to it, uh, or, or the overview of how to answer it, I don't think we're giving a definitive answer. I'm giving a look, this is how you would get the marks on it. Answer to show you that there's more than one way to do it. I think that they will be available from this week. So push yourself to do it this weekend, learn from what I say in the debrief, and then maybe do another mock. Yeah. So if we look at task one on this mock, what does task one look like? Well, it basically has a total of 26 marks. And in those 26 marks, we're asked to draft a section of a report for the directors, and it evaluates the extent to which the sales development strategy could assist in achieving the two strategic objectives. So if we look at that question, what do you see might be necessary for part A? What would you do? Exhibit four. <laughs> um, I'm, well, you have to contextualize that, Quang. What do you mean, exhibit four? I don't know. Looking at the requirements, what we're going to do here, guys, we've got to be able to think of this quite quickly. Put your answers in the uh, chat box. Doesn't matter if they're wrong. I'm just interested in how you're thinking. Yes, what are the options or objectives, actually, um, Apple? So there's two objectives. There's two strategic objectives. And we're looking at how those two strategic objectives link to the sales development strategies. Now the sales development strategies are given in an exhibit. Yep. So you would probably have it. So if I just, um, I wonder whether I can pull this up just one second. I'll show you what I would do here. Yeah. So here I've got a plan. So what, what I've done, can you see a word processing thing on my screen here? Just tell me yes. Ah, no, I'm going to have to share a different screen. Sorry. Stop sharing. Um, sharing. Sharing desktop one. Share. Okay, so I've done a quick plan here. So what I've got here is they are the two strategic objectives. Can we see that on the screen? Just let me know you can see that. Okay, thank you. So I've, I've kind of just copied and pasted this. So this would be in my word processing um, area of the uh, CBE answer space. Yeah, and then what we've got here is we've got then 
in this area, this is a copy and paste of the uh, exhibit. Yep, and they talk about multi-channel network. So in red, uh, retail stores, uh, they're going to expand to other confectionery that don't, take cho don't contain chocolates, such as cakes and sweets. They're going to think about uh, developing sales channels. They're going to de-seasonalize, et cetera, et cetera. So what I, and then it finishes off. So what I basically have done is I probably copied and pasted the key bits in red down here, and you can do that quite quickly. So the sales development strategies are multi-channel network, retail stores, online business, franchises, multi-product. It was just chocolate. Now it's cakes and sweets. They're going to export worldwide. They're going to de-seasonalize. They're going to, uh, you know, think stores are still really important. They want to close 30 to 40 poor performing stores and put the best staff in the other ones, put the yummy in supermarket, develop supermarket accounts. So here we have got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, at least 10 different sales development strategies. So of each of those sales development strategies, how do those link to the strategic objectives? First strategic objective was the widest range of customers. So if we go into retail, online, franchise and supermarkets, obviously that's going to give us a wide range of customers. Um, same with if we go worldwide, we will. Yeah, if we have more products, that's going to help us engage with more customers. Yeah, if we put it in a supermarket, that's going to help the branding and so on and so on. But I looked at the requirement. I saw 16 marks. And then how would my answer look? I would say in reviewing the sales development strategies and their ability to achieve the objectives as observed the following. I'd probably make that in the real exam a bold or an underline develop a multi product strategy by developing it in chocolate products like cakes yummy will be able to increase its revenue and a much wider audience. Boom. Also, if the brand is applicable to cake and sweet products, this will help complement the strategic marketing objectives of increasing the brand awareness, maybe say why. And I would develop that for every single answer. Okay. So let me just uh, reshare the screens I want to do. Um, It's always a bit dangerous when we leave. Um, present to view. Okay. Share the which screen am I going to share? Share desktop three. Okay. Right. So, um, are we are we clear on how I took the requirement here? I thought about 16 marks. I thought about two up to 10, up to 10 for each of the different objectives. And then I did a brainstorm. I thought about the marks and then I came up with a good answer. What do you think? Correct, Hannah. If we didn't use the Ansoff matrix, but answered as you did earlier, it would still be correct. Correct, Hannah. Yes. Um, the Ansoff matrix was used in the answer. So well done, Hannah, for having a go at this mock. Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm not sure it helped putting that there, if I'm honest. Um, you can see how do I got the answer and you didn't have, you certainly didn't have to mention the Ansoff matrix in your answer. So well done. Um, it's clear to me you had a go at that, Hannah. So well done. Um, so you would still be correct. Definitely. Yes. And I used more um, of um, what I saw from the scenario. I used my own opinion more as opposed to trying to, you know, squeeze in an Ansoff matrix. I don't think you needed to do that. Yep. So great. The second part of this says, uh, Nash says, what if the question asked to use a certain framework? It never will, Nash. In the workplace, does, does your boss say to you, using five forces, can you evaluate what's happening? Just ask you to evaluate what's happening. Five forces might help, but you could probably come up with an evaluation without five forces. I would suggest if you have good knowledge of five forces, 
probably get you a few more points, but you don't have to use it. There is no marks. Let me just repeat one more time. There are no marks, just, uh, just in case, there are no marks for talking about technical frameworks. Okay? They are useful as catalysts to develop your answer. Is that's got it. The rest of us, there are no marks. Anyway, I think you got it. Yeah. Second bit says recommend with reasons. Two features that could be included in the website to help build and manage relationships. <gasps> oh, I don't know. I don't know what to say. Well, it's an interesting one. Has anyone ever been on a website of a shop? Mm, might have been. Do they do anything to develop relationships with you? Do they ask you to sign up for a newsletter? Do they offer you a competition? Do they collect cookies from you? Of course they do. Just use any of those things in part B. You don't have to, well, well where's, which exhibit's that from? So someone say, can we bring things in from real life? Of course we can. We know what a good website would do to interact with us more. And that's what we do here. Yeah. Okay, okay, good, good. Um, right. If we look at uh, task two, this asked us, um, they're looking at uh, raising some debt. What are the key ratios and other factors that lenders are likely to consider when reviewing Yummy's finance request? Well, I mean, what would happen in real life if you wanted to borrow money as a company? I'd need to know your credit rating. I'd need to know what assets you have to act as security. I'd need to know your gearing. Uh, I'd need to know the cost of capital. Uh, I'd need to know how comfortable I am with diluting control if I was bringing venture capital. I mean, anything, you know, brainstorm, reasonable. Does that relate to AFM? Mm, relates to FM, it relates a bit, but isn't that common sense of the issues? So you don't need to, I mean, you can mention ratios and you could actually bring one or two of the figures in if you wanted, but if you didn't, you could still get, you know, all the marks. Yeah. So uh, we're then asked to evaluate the appropriateness of alternative financing schemes A and B. And obviously we need to go back to the exhibits and we need to look at A and B and we need to assess each of those schemes. So how, how are they different? I mean, I think one involves venture capitalists, which will dilute power, will change the dynamic of a family company, um, but it will give some cash and you bring some fresh ideas. Uh, so when it says evaluate, give me the good and the bad. Uh, there's 12 marks, it's probably up to eight, up to eight, maximum of 12. Okay, think of it like that. Any comments on that one? Um, do we need to give a recommendation? It often tells you when you need to give a recommendation, Gloria. So I would just, you know, you just ask to evaluate the appropriateness. It doesn't say give a recommendation. If it wants you to give one, it will normally um, ask um however you know i think it's a good question you asked there gloria because if you were a management consultant giving advice you know you don't want a management saying we well, could do that you could do that but i'm not really sure you would normally rely on a management consultant to give you some guidance but it, normally it would ask for a recommendation uh if it really wants you to give one if we look at um task three this asks us to pre prepare one presentational slide with accompanying notes that recommended four precautions that Yummy should take to reduce risk. So this was a, you know, they were worried about peanut oil contamination. So one slide, four notes, that's up to two marks for each note. So personally, I would be in my notes giving two separate mini paragraphs to make sure I get two, 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 and two, if I've got the time. Yeah. Um, so precautions that it should take. So it's just like, you know, how do we take precautions for peanut oil? Um, well, you know, if you have no, I mean, you'll think, how, how do people in Malaysia 
uh, take precautions to make sure uh, halal food products don't get contaminated. They prepare them in different areas. Uh, they separate them. They, they train people how to do it. You know, it would be exactly the same as how to stop people getting peanut oil on their food. Yeah. Um, just going back uh, to task two, someone said, evaluate the appropriateness, yeah, of the alternative. Could we use suitability, acceptability and feasibility? Yes, you could. Um, I would go one step further on suitability, feasibility. So when I think is it suitable, does it build on strengths? Does it complement the portfolio? Yeah. Is it feasible? I think um, six M's, money, manpower, materials, machinery, markets and makeup. And is it acceptable? Would the key players, the key stakeholders be happy? If you want to look at that more, look at my article on strategic planning process on the ACCA website. Yeah, that would be the best place. Um, so evaluate two. And then the next bit is, again, just asking you to give two drawbacks and two benefits of keeping the risk associated. So, you know, what well, it's a hassle, isn't it? We're going to continue to review it. Uh, it's going to. Yeah, we might become desensitized to the risk if it's just there all the time. And we might not, you know, two, two benefits. People might be confident in us. Investors might be happy with us. We're going to have a clear contingency in place. Should there be any contamination with peanut oil? Yep. So, but commercial acumen, we're thinking, mm, um, you know, it, the cost of it may be, and is it feasible to keep spending money? You know, we don't have bottomless pockets. Task four, if we looked at task four, the marks here are quite a bit less. There's only eight marks here. Yep. So here it was pretty much talking about an internal audit report, which um, shows that the people who had been asked to comply to a new control system were not following those directions. Yep. So how should you respond? I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what's this about? What task is it? Oh. I don't think it is any task, to be honest. Um, mm, ah, I'm not sure. Well, actually, there's no base. The bottom line is they've been asked to change and they haven't changed. So could we use change management? We probably could. Yeah. So what would I do? I would first of all I have to communicate to them that it's not acceptable to completely disregard company policy. But I then might want to find out why and why are you doing it and what is the problem and why have you kind of chosen not to follow and, and educate. I mean, when I think of change, participate, educate, communicate. So educate them why it's important to do this, get their buy in, communicate to them the processes so they can, you know, maybe involve them, ask them what, what, what's the problem? How can we make it easier? So all that's inspired by participate, educate, communicate, but I'm applying it in the context of the question. Yeah. Okay. Only eight marks though. So we're doing two and a half minutes a mark, 20 minutes start finish. And then task five, this again is uh, 16 marks. Um, and it, it's basically talking about um, to shore up our supply chain, we're going to start leasing cocoa farms for the chocolate. And so what's the risk of that? The risk is it's not our core business. We're not farmers. We don't manage farms. We just buy um, cocoa beans. But um, I suppose the benefit would be we'd have a guaranteed supply. We would be less susceptible to fluctuations in prices. Um, but you, you also, what about the farm? OK, so I've got there's five points, 14 marks. <sighs> what else could I say? Ooh, if I was to have just give the farmers a fixed fee, they might not work so hard. So there's another point. And I'd say, why? What's the consequence? Well, if you give them a fixed fee, they get the money regardless. Whereas if they have to grow cocoa beans and then sell them on the open market, the open market is likely to only buy the best cocoa beans. So, you, you know, I'm continually pushing myself because I'm thinking about the marketing scheme. I'm thinking, what else can I say? What else can I say? Okay, so um, 
a couple of John says for the report format is a conclusion necessary uh, again John if it asks for a conclusion you must do one um, I, I think conclusions long introductions are a luxury in the SPL exam keep it brief and get stuck into uh, points that acquire marks yeah that would be my advice so there is a kind of a bit of advice on what I'd like you to try and have a go at. Um, it's very achievable. Um, and um, it's important you go through the experience. If you're afraid, if you're worried, face your fear, come out the other end and saying, it's not that bad. But I did spend too long on question one. And next time, I'll do what Sean said, and I'll do a start and I'll do a finish. But if you don't have that experience, you'll never learn. And sadly, you will spend too long on question one in the real exam. And if you spend too long on any question, you, you, you fail, really, because um, your job is to get the first 50% of all the questions. If you do that, you will probably get a little bit more. If you do that with strict time management, you'll pass your exam. Simple. OK, any questions on any of that? um yes i think there's a marking scheme yes for the mark but you, you know the, the problem with marking schemes you know what is the marking scheme we're not at applied skills level here sbl is a very different exam in the real exam to the real markers credit i could show you the mark, credit will be given for any reasonable point so the markers are empowered to interpret what a reasonable point is it's not a technical exam where two and two is four and three and four is seven and there is no deviation from that. Um, I mean, who's right is, um, well, there probably is an answer to this, but who has the best strategy? Is the people with the best strategy Malaysian Airlines or is the people with the best strategy, oh, I've forgotten his name now, Tony Fernandez. Who's the Tony Fernandez airline? They're red. They fly out of uh, KLI2, AirAsia or AirAsia. Who has the best strategy? Malaysian Airlines or AirAsia? They're both successful. I mean, Malaysian Airlines, mm, you know, or, or we could say um, there's, uh, I'm trying to fly Dubai or Emirates. Emirates own fly Dubai. They're one's cheap one, one's an expensive one. They're both different. They're both successful. They both play a different game. Yeah. Okay. For a briefing note format, you, again, John, it, it's you're trying to um, find what is, have a look at an answer, but I, I, as a marker, if it says briefing notes to from date, that's fine. That's fine. Um, so, yeah. Um, thank you, Joanne, um, for all your support. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what I do. Okay. Alrighty. I am going to now probably talk about the most important thing. And the most important thing I want to talk about now is some motivational tips. And these aren't going to say that question one is going to be governance. Question two B is going to be change management and three A. And this is what you hear from these people on YouTube. And I'm like, Oh my God, what what are these people on? Uh, firstly, I, in all my experience of traveling around the world with HCCA, I don't know who you are. And actually, uh, as someone involved with the examining team and all the rest of it, you're talking a load of rubbish. Yeah. So um, hopefully these tips will have more validity. Number one, are you study fit? Yeah, are you study fit? Uh, you will have different times of the day when your brain works best. Are you a morning person? Are you an afternoon person? Do you need food before or do you need food after? Yeah, I think you need to identify when you are performing at your most productive and schedule your study to happen at that particular moment. Think about where you work, when you work, when you exercise and when you relax. Yeah, so really important. When do you work? 
morning, afternoon, when you uh, study. I mean, you might not have a choice in all of these. Exercise really important for the brains to think about that and really important to, you know, imagine being a runner. I've just pulled my microphone again. Is my microphone still working okay? Thank you, Hannah. Um, if I was a marathon runner, I wouldn't run all the time because my muscles would be broken. Yeah, so I need to relax and recover and build stronger muscles in the same way my brain is a muscle and you need to put in the diary relaxation time. The point about putting it in the diary is to have a plan. Yep, in your plan, we have got three weeks till the exam, okay? Therefore, we need to think about what's important. What do we prioritize? Yep, um, there's a method that you might want to look up on the internet called the Ivy Lee method. The Ivy Lee method involves preparing a to do list at the end of each day and writing down a list of six tasks that you want to complete tomorrow ranked in order of importance. OK, and, and I would say, you know, all those things I just mentioned, which were work, study, exercise and relaxation should be in that list of prioritized tasks. But for it to happen, you need to plan. Yeah, for it to happen, you need to plan. I've got a couple of questions here. Uh, so Sashdev says, for example, say it increased by 25% from 2015 to 2016 and 31% from 2016 to 2017. Um, no, I would use specific numbers, uh, Sashdev. As an accountant, would you just say it's gone up a bit or would you give the percentage? So as accountants doing reports in the workplace, I wouldn't say it's gone up. I would give a specific about how much it has gone up. And then I would discuss the consequence or the relevance of by how much it has gone up by. So I would speak in specifics because I'm a finance person. Sean says, any tips for part time students? I'm working through the day and I find often my mind is too tired to revise effectively. Well, Sean, you, you know, we're at strategic professional level. I'd say 95% of people who are doing this exam, maybe even more, are part time students. Yeah. What I'd ask you, Sean, is how many kids do you have? How many kids do you have, Sean? You're single. Uh, how many staff do you have working for you? Sean, junior staff. Okay, so what I'd say to you is, uh, if I want to get something done, I find a busy person because people who all pass often have very, you know, demanding jobs where they have a full team of people they're responsible for. And also, um, they might have four kids to sort out every day and somehow they pass the exam. How do they pass the exam? Well, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But um, you know, you need to find when you can be most productive, Sean. Is it before work? Yeah. Is it at lunchtime? Ask your boss, is it all right if I just spend an hour at lunch studying? I've got my exams. You can have that hour back in spades after my exam. Zhu says, do we need to show detailed workings in the spreadsheet? As I said previously, yes, we do. Yeah. In the spreadsheet, you use formulas. Yeah. That's what you do in the workplace. You don't, you, you know, you use formulas, make things quicker. So yes. Um, so there's just answering, you, you know, part-time students, that's 95% of them. They would prioritize their tasks like I'm suggesting here. Really important. Um, and what they, they're going to do is they're going to think about when are they most productive? Yeah. And everyone's different. Okay. But also, we need to make sure this happens on a regular basis so it becomes a routine. Yeah, a routine will involve sleep. So when do you go to bed? When do you get up? Yeah, you've got to look after that because when you're going to bed and sleeping is when your brain is recovering and getting stronger. Blue light, phones, get rid of them. Distraction. Yeah. So go to bed, get up at a similar time so you're not sleep deprived. Uh, you will know when you're in your ultimate state of flow and trying to be studying when you're in that space. 
when we're in a state of flow, we're much less likely to set to uh, procrastinate. Yeah. And we'll talk more about that. Deadlines help. Yeah, it makes you commit to something, makes you stop procrastinating. Yeah. Uh, so what you're doing at a certain time of the day and put exercise and fun in those um, deadlines. Yeah, break it down into manageable chunks. You know, how you eat an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. Okay. So, um, yeah, make sure you do that. Time management techniques, hopefully use that. There's various, find out which one works for you. Things like the Pomodoro technique, uh, where you break things down into 25 minutes. Again, you can get that app going on your phone, but turn all other notifications off. Basically, you work for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break, and then you do, I think, four cycles of 25 minutes, and then you take a slightly longer break. Yeah, it works. People all over the world use that. So um, what the short bursts do is prevent your mind wandering and you procrastinating. It's also important to give yourself a reward, some time off, even a little reward throughout the day, like you can have that piece of chocolate if you complete that. Yeah. Um, other things that help people achieve things and stop putting things off is they, they create a chain of completed tasks. So you've got to target each day, tick it, and then a target the next day, tick it. Yeah. Uh, maybe commit to a zero day in which you don't do anything. That's a reward. Yeah. One thing I quite like today, and Ryan, I think, is on, on the phone. Um, I think a great thing I, I like was the music. You know, it's morning in the UK and you put in this music on, Ryan, and I was kind of, I was moved by it. So think about your energy levels. What gets you moving? Does music get you moving? Yeah. Uh, does exercise first get you moving? Hydration, really important that we hydrate. That can affect your ability to concentrate. Also think about the food you eat. White flour foods is not great. They're just going to go straight to a glycogen dump. So think about the foods you eat. Think about the environment in which you study. Try and make it uh, clutter free. Yeah, it just, you know, tidy workplace, tidy mind, remove, noti switch notifications off. Yeah, so you get no social media. Yeah, no pings. And exercise and diet, people who are tired, who have big glycogen jumps, sleepy. Yeah, so again, as well as hydration, think about the food you eat. Yeah, certain foods will make you more lethargic than others. Often, you know, white flour, white rice, easy converted, of, uh, what do they call them? Processed foods. You want to eat foods which take longer to digest because that r slows down the release of glucose into the bloodstream. If you release too much, boom, you get a glycogen jump makes you sleepy. That's why people fall asleep after dinner if they eat the wrong food. So uh, research that. But nuts are good. Walnuts are good for your brain. Almonds. Yeah, those kind of things. Really important. Um, so a couple of questions. Um, so uh, Neural said, for financial analysis, do we need to comment on every item in the financial statement or only comment on significant changes? What would you do in the workplace, Nirul, when you're talking to your staff? Would you talk about every single line or would you talk about the significant ones on which action need to be taken? I think you know the answer. Only the significant ones. Cock, I have a question regarding professional skills. Let's say the question awarded eight marks for technical. I write about six points, but six points. But out of six points, four points is correct. I still get full marks in technical. So would it affect my professional skills marks? Um, let me read that again. Uh, yeah, it's, it, you, you don't have to get full marks to get full technical marks, to get full professional skills marks. The professional skills marks are awarded for the tone uh, and the, the lens through which you develop your uh, technical marks. 
Yeah, so I think you're saying, if I didn't get full technical marks, could I not get full professional skills marks? You could. What would the best, what would be your advice about the best things we have to focus on? What are the tips? What are the tips? It's a, you've got to have a top level understanding. You've got to have confidence to express an opinion. Yeah, um, I would say probably my top tip would be to do at least one mock to time and get it marked. That would be my top tip if you really want a top tip. But, you know, is corporate governance coming up? Well, it could do, and you need to appreciate it. So, yeah, appreciate your time. Uh, a quick question. How can I access the recording of this session? Uh, I think Ryan is going to sort that out. Oh, Yap, what's the topic we should focus on this sitting? Well, I've kind of learned, if I let you into a little secret, I used to come to Singapore, Malaysia all the time, and everyone, what are the tips? What are the tips? And um, people used to love me because all my tips always came up. Well, the reason all my tips always came up is I tipped the syllabus. You know, that, if I'm being dead honest, it's a strategic professional level. Yeah, uh, there's certain things that do come up, um, but the thing that we need to be, have most uh, ability in doing is to be able to express an opinion. Uh, Abirami, how to prevent lethargy during a four hour exam? <laughs> um, well, you're obviously a very chilled out person, Abirami. Uh, if you fall asleep in the exam, I'm normally quite worried in the exam. Uh, I'll, I'll, yeah, let me help you. How do I, how do I stop falling asleep in the exam? Uh, let, let me uh, say what I would do. So most important, do at least one mock to time, get it marked. Yep. I would also read, if you go onto student accountant, put my name in it, you'll get lots of articles that I've written. Yeah. Uh, on exam technique and stuff, read them. Yep, they're all in Student Accountant Magazine. It's an app. Um, I think the most important thing for me uh, of how, how can we um, pass this exam is, you know, I think you need to really have had a conversation with yourself. Why? Why do you want to pass this exam? What is being an accountant going to do for you? Yeah. Have you thought about that? Or is it just because you want to be a professional person? Yeah. Who asked me the question before? Let me just go back. Um, yeah. Sean was wondering, you know, how can he stop his mind getting tired? Well, let me tell you a story. I kind of a student hadn't done some uh, homework for me. And, and I kind of said, look, you know, how come you've not done the homework? If you'd done it, you would have learned it. And that would be great. She goes, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm really sorry, but um, I just, you know, life's busy. And I'm like, well, life's busy for everyone. But then she said, well, you know, I, I've, I've, I haven't been studying for 10 years and I've just come back to this. And I said, oh, well, how come? She said, well, um, my husband died uh, about a year ago and I've got four kids under six, four kids under six. True story. I says, oh my goodness, okay. So, um, you know, that's challenging. She goes, yeah, it's challenging. Fortunately, my dad is um, quite helpful. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm working. By the time I get the train back to my house, uh, you know, I, I don't get in the house before seven o'clock in the evening. Okay. So she basically then, you know, her older, I think a five-year-old and a four-year-old, she reads them a story and then they go to sleep. The other two have often gone to sleep already. Um, and then she makes herself some food, you know, does some washing for the kids and stuff. And then, you know, it's like nine o'clock and she's absolutely shattered. So she can't do any study. And I say, oh, OK, OK, I'm, I'm kind of relating to you a bit more now. And she says, so uh, the other problem is my kids get up quite early. Yeah, and my, my kids tend to get up somewhere between quarter to six, quarter past six is when they wake. And then, you know, I need to be off to work by about 8.15. So what I do is I tend to wake up about 2.30 and between 2.30 and 5.30, I managed to get some study in. 
Yeah. What were you doing at 2.30 this morning? What were you doing at 5.30 this morning? Yeah. The other thing, though, was why she did that. She did that because she had this drive that she wanted to send her kids to private school. And unless she was a qualified accountant or finance director, she could never imagine having the income to afford to pay for that. So therefore, she was qualifying as an accountant so she could pay for her kids' education. So she was driven. Yeah, she had a goal. She had something to motivate her. She had a reason why she wanted to pass this exam. What's your reason you want to pass this exam? Because I want to be an accountant. Is that going to get you at 2.30 in the morning? I don't think it is. So find your reason would be my advice. Find your reason. Yeah, really important because that's going to get you out of bed in the morning. That is going to wake up your mind. That's going to stop you being lethargic. That is the key. Yeah. So can I pass it in three weeks? If you want to, you can. How badly do you want it? If you want it badly, you'll get it. So to get it or to want it badly, you've got to find why you want it badly. And if you do that, you'll be fine. Yeah. That for me is the most important tip to stop you being a lethargic. Okay. Makes sense. Anyone got a strong reason why they want to pass the exam? Not thought about it? Well, do so. Sometimes when I'm doing courses, you know, for like finance directors in KL and stuff, you know, the feedback I get is, you know, they don't, they didn't really listen to some things I've said, which could be game changing for their companies, but they kind of say, oh, Macan no good, Macan no good. It's like, who cares about the food? Yeah. This is an opportunity to massively increase your shareholder wealth. This is an opportunity to pass your exam. Yeah. Make sure you take it. Get on with life without exams. It's a nightmare. Okay, so that's my top tip as you asked for it. Another article on how to plan that route. So before we, um, I'm going to like uh, wrap it soon-ish. But before I do, do we have, I'm going to give you a kind of five minute warning on questions. Do we have any more questions on anything I've said uh, this afternoon? This is your chance to ask me. No. It's up to you. It's difficult. I'll give you my contact details, but it, it's, you know, there's 350 people registered for this. So it, it's quite difficult for me to have any bandwidth to uh, answer 350 people's questions. But any question you put up now, I can guarantee I'll answer it straight away. You've asked me lots of great questions. Uh, so maybe we've exhausted them. But I'll just give a few more moments and then I'm going to start uh, just summarizing what we need to do. Okay, okay. All righty. Um, I'm assuming I've answered everything that you, um, Harith, uh, who should I contact? No, you will be contacted yourself about the recording, Harith. So in terms of recording, you will be contacted. Um, any tips on training the mind to have a correct mindset in approaching questions? Um, good question. Um, the question I would say here is um, you've got to have a growth mindset, whether you believe it 
or disbelieve it is probably true. So kids who think, oh, I might fall, often do fall. Kids who believe, I mean, Olympic athletes do not go into the Olympics believing they're going to lose. Certainly the winners don't. They could see themselves on the pedestal four years earlier with a gold medal around their neck. Yeah, that's what you need. You need it's called um, positive mindset. Uh, you know, there's, there's, it's a psychological phenomenon that's proven. Whether you believe it or disbelieve it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy often. So you have done the work, you have, you know, put the effort in. You want to pass this exam. This exam is going to be nailed by you. You can pass it. So a question you don't know what to answer. What can I say? Oh, my goodness. I don't know. Well, back out a little bit and come back in from a different way. It's about governance. Okay, I know this about governance. Will that help? Probably will. It might get me 40%, keeping my grade point average high. Yep. So positive mindset, really important. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so most importantly then is a call to action and an implementation of these ideas. Yep. What are we going to do? We're going to, if not already, start this today. We're going to break our study into manageable chunks. We're going to look after our mental health by doing some mindfulness just to get ourselves steady. And we're also going to look after our brain and make sure it is most effective in this journey by using exercise and diet to help it. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, contact details, I have a website where I put a lot of stuff SBL related on it. I have an email, sean at seanpurcell.co.uk. I put a lot on LinkedIn. So, um, you know, contact me on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you should get a post. Even better, I summarize those posts in a regular newsletter I send to students. So you'll get a newsletter that basically just keeps your mind focused in the right area. Um, so I would sign up for a newsletter as well. Uh, if you if you contact me on LinkedIn, I'll give you a link to sign up to a newsletter. But I think a newsletter, the problem with LinkedIn is, uh, you know, I've got lots of people following me on LinkedIn, but LinkedIn is funny. It doesn't often um, send my post to every single connection. You know, it, it, it kind of limits it. Whereas if you sign up for a newsletter, You'll, you'll definitely get all, all, all I say that's relevant for your exam. Okay, uh, also, I mean, I tend to do this with all my students. I run uh, courses uh, and I communicate with them every day on WhatsApp. So, you know, you can be living in Malaysia, you can be living in China and people WhatsApp me and uh, I get right back to them. Yeah, but there's a limit to how much I, I can talk to people on WhatsApp who, you know, I've, I've got to look after my students who are on my course, but. That's, you know, if you want to, you know, if you can't get hold of me on e I, WhatsApp is another way. OK, so that's that's me. That's how you can get on with things. Just to remind you, most important thing is for you to keep your eye on that prize and for you to keep your eye on that prize. You have to have articulated in your mind what that prize is. Yep. Get clarity. It's got to mean something that will pull you towards success. So thank you for listening. Thanks for your questions. All the very best of luck. And think about all those points. Maybe watch this again if you get it on recording. And yeah, that will be, I really want you to pass this exam. All the very best. Thank you for your questions. And I'd love to see you in Malaysia soon. Hopefully things are going to open up and I can get back there. All righty. So contact me on LinkedIn, get the newsletter. That should help. No problem at all. Thank you all very much for your kind wishes. Um, and don't thank me. Thank Joanne and thank Ryan, who have put this together, have made sure all the technology works. And, you know, thank you, ACCA Malaysia, for putting on uh, a great event that everyone can benefit from. So thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Joanne. All the very best. I'm going to... Um, stop sharing my screen. I'm going to bid you um, good afternoon and lovely talking to you. All right. All the very best.